we're going to talk about a personality trait which is agreeableness in one end of the distribution and something called sometimes called antagonism on the other end um, it's difficult it's a difficult trait to conceptualize in my estimation it's always been the one that's puzzled me the, the most in some ways and I also think it's the one that's gets most obviously troublesome at both ends of the spectrum so extremely agreeable people are empathetic and compassionate and compliant but the downside of that is that they are not that good at standing up for themselves and they're and so they're often manipulated and pushed around um, for example they're not as good at negotiating for their own salaries and that's something we'll discuss in a little bit and my experience clinically has been that agreeable people the consequence of their compliance is that they tend to be resentful because just because you're agreeable and compliant doesn't mean that at some level of your psyche you're not interested in a fair deal and if you're not particularly good at negotiating for yourself especially in the presence of disagreeable or antagonistic people then you're going to be left with the short end of the stick I think the typical complaint of someone who's very agreeable is I do so much for other people and they seem to do so little for me and so if you feel that way um, there's a reasonable probability that you're agreeable there's some probability that you're too agreeable and maybe you should stop being so easy to get along with and that's one possibility on the other end of the distribution the antagonistic end well if you're antagonistic enough you end up in prison it's the best personality predictor of antisocial behavior and seems to be associated with sort of cold-blooded aggression rather than the reactive form which would be more characteristic of negative emotion neuroticism so and I think that people who are lower in agreeableness or higher antagonism are probably predatory now you know human beings are pre predators and we have been for a huge swath of our evolutionary history maybe for all of it you know maybe not when we were one-celled animals but for a huge a huge chunk of it and during that time our capacity to be predators has definitely been key to our survival women aren't after resources that's wrong they're after the factors that predict resources so what we did was we showed women a bunch of pictures it was this say, say several pictures of the same guy so there was several guys and each guy was in four conditions the photo of each guy was in four conditions same photo right so one guy was poor and stupid poor and useless one guy was rich and useless one guy was rich and useful and one guy was poor and useful so the rich useless guy had won a lottery and it paid out like four thousand dollars a month for the rest of his life so no matter how useless he was he couldn't squander all of it he had resources right the poor useless guy well we don't even have to define that everybody understands that the rich useful guy well that's easy to understand the poor useful guy worked for a non-governmental agency it was a charity you know in a charitable organization and so he was he had high occupational status but low income and that wasn't likely to change so then we asked women to rate these men on a bunch of different attributes including personality but also on dateability basically and also on probability of considering a long-term relationship with someone like this and wealth had no main effect the only effect was usefulness so the poor useful guy and the rich useful guy were attractive more attractive to the women than the two useless guys regardless of their socioeconomic status and the women judged the useful guys as higher in openness and conscientiousness which was pretty smart because openness is basically intelligence and conscientiousness is hard work and those are the best predictor of socioeconomic success so yay women good work <laughs> any other questions no it's not exactly appearance it's more like signs of health and that's associated and it isn't that it isn't even that 
The things that have made women attractive to men across time are the things that are associated with health and therefore reproductive capacity. So, for example, waist to hip ratio is a marker. 0.68 seems to be about ideal. Why? Well, it turns out that women who have a lower, higher, uh, I can't figure it out at the moment, more waist than hips are more likely to die, for example, of cardiovascular disease. It's an unhealthy distribution of body fat for women. And so that seems to be a negative fitness marker. And then symmetry, for example. I mean, women like symmetrical men too, don't get me wrong. But men are more attracted, say, to, to, to physical health than women. Um, one of the markers for physical health is also symmetry, and that's associated with beauty. Clear skin, all these things are associated with health and youthfulness. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty much that. Female criteria, all respondents. Correlation between socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners. For men it was 0.49, that's a big correlation. For women it was 0.04, that's zero, fundamentally. So, the correlation between male socioeconomic status and frequency of simultaneous partners is 0.5 It's a huge effect, for women it's zero Now that's a big difference, so, you know, one of the things you might ask yourself too I don't know if this is a reasonable thing to, to ask or not But I've always thought that The hard people to explain are the people who are hyper achievers You know, the ones who are way out on the Pareto distribution And there aren't very many of them, and they're usually, they're usually men you know, so if you look at the median num number of publications, for example, that a female academic makes and a male academic, they're pretty much the same. But the mean for men is higher, and that's all driven by a small subset of men who are way the hell out in the Pareto distribution. Now, you might ask, well, why is that? Well, it's simple. If you want to be way out on the Pareto distribution, so you're in the top, say, 1% of performers, or even one-tenth of 1% of performers, what do you have to do? Well, first, having an IQ of like 145 or above, that's really helpful. Then you should be insanely industrious. So maybe you'll work 90 hours a week or 100 hours a week at nothing but your stupid occupation. And maybe you'll do that for like 50 years. And so if you do that, well, you're going to be in that top 1 in 1,000 category. Well, the issue isn't why there are so few women in that category. The issue is why are there any men at all in that category? Right? Because it's, it's an insane lifestyle in many ways. You know, um, it, it means that there isn't much left there for the rest of your life. You're hyper-concentrating on a single thing. Now, why would men do that? Well, here's a hypothesis. One of the things that drives the probability that a woman will find a man attractive enough to sleep with is his status. So then you can think, well, that's an extra motivational boost for men. Now, whether that's conscious motivational boost or not, is not the point. The question is, is it, a, is it a boost that might have been instantiated as an evolutionary element of general motivation? Well, men are more competitive, they're more disagreeable. And if they're more disagreeable and more competitive, they seem to do better, especially in high-status jobs. And then women are more likely to... Pick men like that for sexual partners, so it's, at some point it becomes difficult to avoid the conclusion Especially since we know that the men on the way out on the tail end of the Pareto distribution Are disproportionately likely to sleep with many women So, Warren Beatty, I think, 15,000? That was his estimate 15,000 women And... Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the basketball player, he figured 10,000 So, and so for, the, for every one guy who's got those numbers racked up, that's 10,000 guys who don't So the male success distribution is extreme And it's associated with outlier success in some important dimension of socio-economic success and then Female reproductive opportunity is not So, you know, is that relevant? Well, you know, it depends on how you think It's hard for me to see that it can't be relevant So, questions?
you had a question? Like, so what that means is the higher the job, like the higher their status, the more partners they have? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And, and but this, this is a single study, but this data is common. Now, there's, there's some interesting correlates of this. So, for example, you might say, why are males much more likely to be to engage in homicide? And Daly and Wilson figured this out a long while back, and what they showed was a very, very cool study. They took the level of income inequality in each county in the US and in Canada, and then they correlated that with the homicide rate. And what they found was that the higher the rate of inequality, so the more people at the bottom and the fewer people at the top, the higher the male homicide rate. And the correlation was 0.8, something like that, 0.85, it was like, it's the whole reason. So what happens is that when the competition between men gets intense because hardly anyone can win, then males start to kill each other. Now, Daly also, Martin and Daly also tried to figure out if that was a good idea, so they studied Chicago. And what they found was, well, most male and male homicides are young men, and a lot of them, they're within race, and they're often in dominance disputes. It's like, you know, maybe it's a gang thing. And it's like, well, you shoot me or I'll shoot you. It's like, whose victim and whose perpetrator is not that obvious? So what happens in Chicago? Well, typically, the charge is plea bargain down to self-defense. Then, no one's willing to testify against the guy because, well, after all, he just shot someone. And then he's in prison for two years because that's the, that's the sentence. And then he's out in 18 months if he behaves reasonably well. So then he's killed someone and he's back on the street. And guess what? His status has increased substantially. So you can think about it as a socioeconomic slash sexual decision. And we also know that as economic disparity grows, the social stability decreases. And the reason for that seems to be, well, mostly seems to be male-on-male -male aggression. And so what I, what I think probably happens is that if there's a fair bit of chance for men to climb the ladder, then only the most disagreeable of them become violent. But as you crank down on the opportunities so that the competition gets more and more intense, the level of disagreeableness that it takes in order to catalyze aggression starts, the level of disagreeableness that it takes to catalyze aggression starts to decrease until if it gets so intense that there's no possibility for status then the whole bloody society is going to flip over because the guys at the bottom who are like all the guys are going to decide that this is a stupid game and they'd rather flip the board over and you know set the markers to zero and see how they come up in the new society so it's possible that one of the things that motivates revolutions in human society is excessive inequality and the reason that that's a problem is because it's so tightly linked to male reproductive opportunity so